Um, I think, is this the right version of this talk? Sure. Um, I want to, before I begin, really, I want to tell a story um, from the book Art and Fear. It's a book about the sort of the craft and morality and ethics of art making. And the, the authors tell a story about a pottery class. Uh, the professor came in the first day of class and divided the students in half. Um, he said, the group on the left, I'm going to grade you just on the quantity of pots you make this year. I'm going to bring in my bathroom scale at the end of the semester, and we're going to weigh every pot you made. And if you make 40 pounds of pots, you'll get an A. And if you make 30, you'll get a B, and so on. And the group on the right, I'm going to judge you on one pot. You have to present to me your perfect pot at the end of the semester, and I don't care what you do between now and then. And as the story goes, it was evident to everyone in the class from the very first week that all of the works of the finest quality were coming from the group that was being judged for quantity. <laughs> It seems that while the quality group was spending a lot of time worrying about perfection, about creating the perfect thing, the quantity group just started making pots. And that's where all the good work was coming from. And I want you to keep that in mind as I give the rest of this talk about the way that we've traditionally approached making strategy in the world and in the corporate sector and in the cultural sector and how there may be some alternatives to getting the best things for society and for our institutions. So keep that anecdote in mind. Um, I'll read these few, these few quotations. Uh, Virtually all major, non uh, major for-profit corporations threatened with rapid technological change and mounting international competition developed strategic plans. This is from a Michael Kaiser who wrote Strategic Planning for the Arts. Another quote. Um, this one is from uh, Peters and Waterman, In Search of Excellence, which is one of the best known business books in the English language. They write, an organizational chart is not a company, nor a new strategy, an automatic answer to corporate grief. We all know this, but like as not, when trouble lurks, we call for a new strategy and probably reorganize. Eventually, the old culture will prevail. And then this by Jack Welch, who was the former CEO of General Motors in the United States. He said, in real life, like hell. So I think um, I've worked in the cultural sector for my entire adult life. I was trained as a painter and a printmaker, and I got my first job at the Smithsonian Institution 26 years ago, uh, cleaning plexiglass cases for exhibitions. And then, like many of my colleagues, the World Wide Web came along and got very interesting, and there weren't many people who knew anything about it, and so I started learning about the web as an independent study project. I eventually founded and ran technology and new media offices for three of the Smithsonian Museums. And since 2008, I was the director of web and new media strategy for the Smithsonian in Washington. It's the world's largest museum and research complex, 6,000 employees, 137 million physical objects, uh, 20 or 30 million physical visits a year, hundreds of millions of online visits. Um, it's a big place. And I saw a lot of strategic plans. Uh, and I got to work with a lot of institutions outside the Smithsonian on developing strategy. And I began to see that it didn't work very well. Something was wrong. And that's really what this talk is about, a different approach to this problem. So the basic ideas of what strategy is make a lot of sense to me. Um, the creation of a unique and valuable position involving a set of activities, pretty basic. Strategy requires trade-offs, right? You can't do everything. Was it uh, Niels van der Rohe who said, the genius of the architect is what you leave out? It's what to leave out. So not doing is very important. 
And then finally, you create a fit among an organization's activities. Generally, strategy is about finding some harmonious set of component activities that make sense as a whole, make more sense when combined than they do separately. So that's very rational, makes sense, very safe thing. Um, but I think strategy is overrated. Strategy itself is an overrated science, and I've learned over many years of doing this that most strategies fail. So, uh, and I've learned that strategy is not as important as what you choose to work on, and you have many more choices than you maybe did five or ten years ago. What you choose to work on and how you choose to work. Think about pottery class, how you choose to do that job. So, let me explain. Strategy is overrated. Ten reasons why. First, um, strategy is over-glamorized. It was created by a bunch of uh, Boston intellectuals sometime in the 50s and 60s to answer a certain set of problems that big businesses in the United States had. And it's become a very sexy thing to be a strategist. The strategists have a lot of... Uh, uh, reputation and pull within organizations, it gets a lot of attention. But mostly this is up at the top level of, of big corporations working to do their jobs. It has very little to do with nonprofits, NGOs, public sector institutions um, at its highest level. Strategy, strategic planning processes tend to be internal, whereas most of the things that you need to happen in order for your strategies to succeed happen outside your walls. Almost everything that you need to succeed doesn't happen inside your institution. It happens in the minds and lives of your users, the public, your customers. A strategy is way, way, way too slow. Strategy processes. So this is a, a graph, a conceptualization. You see business charts like this all the time. This is time. You have the buy-in of your colleagues. You have trust. You have time. And as the process goes on and on and on, all of these things decrease. So if your strategy process takes a year or two years, sometimes three years to make, by the time you get to the end, your problems or the problems you started with are no longer relevant. You're all sick of each other. You can't bear to read the report anymore. You can't even bear to work on it anymore. So this uh, exacerbates, makes more complicated every problem you're trying to solve the longer the process carries on. Um, Strategy is too static. So this type is small. This says three years ago, now, three years from now. Now I've seen this happen many times. When you start a strategy process, you have a problem, an, an idea, there's some kind of urgency in the room. You gather together and you start doing research about what your competitors, your colleagues, your other institutions are doing. Most of that research is based on things that happened three years in the past. So when you take your snapshot of what the best practices in the cultural industry are, you're basing that on the last three years of knowledge. Then you take a year or two to write your strategy. So those ideas you started with are now five to seven years out of date. And then you take another three years to implement the strategy. By the time you're done, the knowledge and the problems you're building your strategy on are maybe 10 years old. And that process is accelerating now because technology is changing so quickly. So this process, any length of time it takes to develop a strategy is uh, you're freezing the old assumptions of the past. I have a good example I can talk about later if we have some time of exactly this thing, to ha this thing happening. Um, strategic planning often overlooks crucial activities. Um, this is a reference to the clothesline paradox. And if you heard the talk I gave at the Poland Museum the other day, you'll know what this is. The clothesline paradox was thought of by environmentalist Steve Baer. And he observed that we tend to value activities that can be measured easily over equally impactful activities that are difficult to measure. And the example he uses is uh, drying your clothes. It's good for the economy if you buy a clothes dryer. The economy can see that activity sees you buy, you, know, you buy the clothes, wash, the clothes dryer, you pay for the electricity, you pay for repairs. Um, uh, it's easy for the economy to see. Equally impactful is hanging your clothes outside in the sun, 
but that activity vanishes from the economy. It's hard to measure, it's hard to celebrate, no one has a vested interest in it. The same thing happens in memory institutions. We tend to value things we can measure, visitors through the doors, the number of items we have in our collections, the number of experts we have, over equally impactful but harder to measure activities like better Wikipedia articles, better reuse by school children, more artists in your society. Um, strategy is too often written for a very small group of decision makers, directors, boards of directors, donors, members of government, and very, too, very seldom is it written for the people it has to affect, staff, experts, and the public. This um, bunch of old white guys sitting around the table uh, is labeled too much of this, and this says too little of this. So strategy is too inward looking. Strategy is incomplete. Um, most strategies only partially describe everything that needs to happen in order for the strategy to succeed. Almost always they leave out the part that involves some miracle happening with the public. Some, some spark of imagination happening in the outside world. I, I, I think um, I've used a quote here from Walter Keitchel. Changing your company's strategy almost always proves tougher than you thought it would, but it's inevitably easier than changing your culture. We talked a little bit at the Poland Museum about organizational change. Uh, it's one thing to write a strategy, it's another thing to motivate people to, to get it, to have them understand it. Change winds up being the hardest part. Um, most strategies that I've seen uh, are actually, we would say, cheerleading taking credit for things the organization is already doing. Very seldom do they address difficult problems in clear language or expose dissonance or stresses within institutions. They're not about telling truth, really. They're about taking credit for existing conditions. This quote is from Nietzsche. Uh, Most people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed. Um, this is a collaborator of mine, uh, uh, Leo Mullen from Navigation Arts back in the States. We were walking up uh, the stairs to present our strategy for the Smithsonian Institution to the, the boards of directors, and he leaned over to me and he said two things. He said, first thing he said was, you know, this actually stands about a 3% chance of succeeding even if we get it approved. It's <laughs> like, thanks, Leo, you tell me now. And then the other thing he said, he said was at the end of the day, the people approving this strategy don't really matter. I mean, they do, but it's, it has to mean something to the people who have to do the work every day. And this little bit of truth, I think, strategies almost never succeed. I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Walter Keitschel, who was the uh, editor of For Forbes? Forbes magazine for many years, uh, Fortune magazine, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, he wrote a book called The Lords of Strategy that's a wonderful, mind-blowing read about this, this dark art of strategic development. Um, but this is from an article he wrote called um, Corporate Strategists Under Fire. And he tells a story about interviewing strategy experts about their work. So this is Walter Keitchel, and this, these are the, the anonymous strategists that he's interviewing. So Keitchel says, I had this experience with every single consulting firm I interviewed. He asked them, how many of your clients have strategies? And they replied, if there are clients, they have a strategy. He asks, how many can effectively implement those strategies? Uh, long pause, much verbal reluctance, much visible reluctance. This is not for attribution, right? <laughs> right, right. Is it 50%? Oh, no, not 50%. 30%? Um, no. After a little more back and forth, the final estimate would emerge. Fewer than 10% of their clients, in the consultant's own judgment, were fully successful at putting their corporate strategies to work. And I think it, you have to remember that this is at the top level of expertise in the world of strategy development. The best strategists working for the richest and most capable corporations in the world. Of that group, only 10% of the strategies can even begin to be put to work. So imagine what they're like in our sector, government, non-for-profit, social sector. 
Um, John Cotter, in his famous book, A Sense of Urgency, says that 70% of all business change initiatives fail worldwide since World War II. 70%. He mourns the impact to the world of 70% of change initiatives failing around the world. What if you could just take a couple percentage points off that? Imagine the, you know, the, the renaissance of, of human happiness that would emerge from that. So there has to be a better way of doing this, right? This is clearly a terribly flawed way of building the future. And I've been thinking about this and thinking of the example of the pottery class that I talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Quantity and experimentation over high-minded thought processes trying to engineer a future. Um, and I'm also remembering Steve Jobs' famous line, or the one that was attributed to him. He said, real artists ship, meaning they deliver a thing that works. Emphasize working, emphasize working product, working code, over theory. Um, and we really forget how far we've come in our ability to do things uh, in our organizations. This is uh, a, a, an interview with um, Peter Diamandis, who is a very interesting guy. He invented the X Prize, which uh, rewarded, so it's a challenge prize that awarded $10 million to the first group that could put a privately financed and designed rocket ship into outer space. Uh, amazing, fascinating guy. And I won't read this whole quote, but he said, in 2000, the cost of starting an internet company was an average of $5 million for the bandwidth, the servers, the software, all of that. That number has gone from $5 million to $5,000 for the equivalent in 2014. A thousand-fold reduction. And yet we forget about this stuff. We just take it all for granted. So it's easier than it's ever been to do. To do. Not to think, but to do. Um, and I draw some inspiration, too, from some of the, I think in many ways, software is the mother tongue for a lot of the philosophy of innovation that we see now. There's a, a, a field of programming called extreme programming, platform thinking, A-B testing, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, these concepts uh, about an alternative way to do things and learn by doing that have emerged from the software industries are really important in uh, my thinking around this. And I'll highlight specifically the Agile Manifesto which is a series of assertions about the right way, the most productive and profitable way, profitable way to write code these days. And the Agile Manifesto says, it, it, it expresses a series of biases. And I love the way they do this. Biases, not black and white. Um, individuals and interaction over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. And they continue, that is, while we value the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. I think that's a very humane way of putting it. Um, an example of this kind of set of values in practice is a way of building websites called A-B testing, where uh, instead of coming up with a grand theory of how users will interact with your websites, the same way we do with exhibitions often, um, we just in a closed conference room or a design studio, we decide how users will interact with, how learners will respond to our exhibits, and then we build that thing and it's locked down forever. A-B testing uses a series of small experiments comparing one version of a website to another to see how we can improve the outcomes we want. For a business, it's how to get more people to buy something for an educational institution, it's how to get people to learn something or give something back to the community. Um, several articles are about businesses that have, have achieved literally billions of dollars worth of profit by finding, rather than designing, improvements to their projects, to their processes. Another concept here in this new way of thinking about strategy is the concept of permissionless innovation. This is a, a book by Alexis Ohanian, who co-founded the website Reddit, which is one of the most colossally used websites in the world. 
hundreds of millions, I think several billion page views a month go to Reddit. And Alexis uh, wrote his book called Permission, Permissionless Innovation, How the Future Will Be Made, Not Managed. Uh, this idea that with the falling cost and increasing ability to do things, remember Peter Diamandis, the cost of starting a web business has fallen by 1,000% in, what was that, 10 years? Five years. Um, uh, examples. One of my favorite examples is the Sunlight Foundation in Washington, D.C. redesigned the website for our U.S. Supreme Court without their permission. They just did it. They thought it was a badly flawed website. You couldn't search on upcoming cases. You couldn't search on past case law. Um, they redesigned the website. They wrote a very thoughtful blog post about it, and they offered the design improvements back to the Supreme Court, which wisely accepted many of those solutions. You, you wouldn't have seen something like that 10 or 20 years ago, but now it's almost literally child's play. Another example, art historian Alexandra Corey became personally offended by the Uffizi Gallery's reluctance to put its collections online and reluctance to share meaningful educational materials with the public. So what did she do? And she was not a software programmer. She, she and her husband, instead of going to the beach one August, they watched YouTube videos about how to make iPhone and Android apps. And she created her own iPhone application and ebook guide to the Uffizi Gallery without their permission. And if you think they weren't pissed off by that, you don't know Italy very well. Um, they were really uh, shocked and offended that someone would have the audacity to do it. Another example from Italy, these group of, uh, this group of 20-something young people became offended that many cultural institutions in Italy had no interest in being online, uh, being on, even on Facebook, or putting any of their collections online. So they created their, a movement called Sveglia Museo, which means literally wake up museums. They created a brand identity, a Twitter page, a Facebook page. They began pairing web practitioners from Italian institutions that were uh, not so interested in online with counterparts uh, in America and Europe who were more interested in being online so they could train each other. They created an ebook guide to getting your museum online. By the time I found out they were writing this ebook, they had already finished it and were moving on to the next project, all without asking anybody's permission. Uh, final example, uh, Nick Gray from Museum Hack. He was a self-described finance dude uh, living in New York City, and a girlfriend, a date, took him to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which he had found to be really boring and frustrating. But his date explained the museum, explained the artifacts in a really engaging way. And he started his own business to take people who don't really love art or museums through the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but to explain it in a way that was engaging and interesting. Um, he calls the business Museum Hack. And um, uh, he says that uh, in order to be able, in order to take groups through the Metropolitan Museum, you need to have, if you have more than nine people in your group, you need to ask permission. So he takes nine people through, only breaks the groups up, so he doesn't have to ask anybody's permission to basically hack the museum. Um, oh gosh, I have more great examples. Do you guys know this story? This is the um, bust of Nefertiti. It's a Time Magazine said it was one of the most, the top 20 plundered artifacts in the world. It was appropriated and is in a German museum. It's a cultural object treasured um, in Egypt. And these two uh, German Iraqi artists did an illegal 3D scan, as the story goes. The myth, the myth is that they hung the scanner from an Xbox around their necks and walked around the statue <laughs> as it was in public. I, there's some doubt that that's really what they did. But they created a very accurate 3D scan. They uploaded it to the internet uh, with a free license that let anyone in the world use it. A museum back in Egypt printed out a high definition scan and is exhibiting the object as an act of protest because they want that object to be repatriated to their home country. Um, who can control that? It's completely permissionless at this point.
Oh, and there's a great ad, I'll skip this, but there's great language about the beauty of open culture, the importance of open cultural data here. Um, now I'm going to skip through that too. All right, so um, all of this sort of building evidence, building a body of knowledge and evidence that there, there's probably a better way of making strategy, more about practice and less about theory. So uh, I first heard this phrase, think big, start small, move fast, at the Clinton Global Initiative Summit in 2012, I think. Um, no, maybe about five years ago. And it seems to be the motto of the movement of social entrepreneurship, using the business practices of entrepreneurial uh, business creation for the social good. And this was the phrase, and it kind of stuck with me as an expression, think big, start small, move fast. It captured the ethos of this moment, this intersection we have between old ways of planning and doing and new ways. So I spent years trying to pick this apart and describe the pattern in a way, um, and I'm getting closer. Uh, so first, what does Think Big do? Thinking big is important, I think, because there are so many more possibilities that we have as individuals to do impactful global work, permissionless sometimes, than we've ever had before. And because there are manifestly so many big challenges in the world for us to work on. Um, 3.1, actually, this is now 3.3 billion people are now online. Um, that's gone up from 2.4 billion since I started giving this kind of talk. Um, the next 5 billion are very certainly going to come online in the next 5 to 10 years. It's almost certain that everyone on the planet who wants one in the near future will have an internet-connected mobile device. There's already in, uh, Tom Friedman writes, there's a, in India, India has an actual middle class of 300 million people. It has now a virtual middle class of 300 more people who are profoundly poor, but they now, because of cheap mobile devices and tablets, have access to the internet. The same access now to government and information that their richer neighbors have. And they're starting to demand the same level of government services and the same amount of human dignity that their richer, more privileged neighbors are having. This is going to affect billions of people on the planet, not just in our lifetimes, but in the near future. It's probably already happening in Poland in a lot of ways. Um, so clearly there are immense and compelling challenges to overcome. This is a report I found from the Global Challenges Foundation that lists um, 12 new risks to human existence itself. Uh, some of these are, are pretty great. I love the graphics of the apocalypse, too. There's definitely a graphical style of doom. But some of these are synthetic biology, nanotechnology. This is a really great one. Future bad global governance. They see as a risk to human existence. You know, wow, each of these is a problem waiting to be solved. The United Nations has articulated 17 global challenges and 169 specific tactical things to achieve by 2030 as part of the Sustainable Development Goals. This is big work. Um, and this kind of big problem solving at scale, this kind of big problems can be taken on now at a global scale in a way they couldn't a few years ago. I'll talk about this example later of Hank and John Green. Um, Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, and his collaborator um, Jeffrey Rosenberg argue that you need a big, a big mission in your institution, a big hard goal, because big bets attract the best people. And ironically, they argue, sometimes big bets are easier to achieve than small ones, because small goals can't attract the talent that you need to succeed. Um, one of my heroes is John Wood, who created the nonprofit uh, uh, Room to Read. I recommend his book, Leaving Microsoft to Change the World. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing guy. But his, he writes in his book, think big from day one. The problems facing the world today are immense. This is not a time for incremental thinking. If a cause is worth devoting your time to, then you owe it to yourself and those you will serve to think in a big way. The side benefit is that thinking big can be a self-fulfilling prophecy because bold goals 
will attract bold people. I was skeptical of this kind of rhetoric for a while uh, because it seemed, it seemed like hyperbole, it seemed very idealistic, but I keep hearing this from people who have achieved immense things, and I think there must be a kernel of truth in it. I've also worked, had the privilege of working with great teams and poor teams, and the difference is incredible. The difference that a, t a big goal can make in attracting top talent is, I cannot uh, overestimate it. So, think big, start small. That's kind of an interesting dichotomy. Um, big change seems hard at first, but small actions aligned with a big goal can add up quickly. Uh, there was a little bit, well, this is I think one of the big questions of our time. Will the future be made by big institutions or in little startups, 10,000 individual little teams working on their own? I think, I'm not sure which. I know where I think I'd place my bet now. But I think this is a big question for all of you to serve. And there's some evidence that the future that we want to live in as citizens isn't going to come from the big guys. Here's a quote, um, again from Walter Keitchell. Uh, and this is from, uh, what is this from? Oh, a professor at Harvard, business strategist at Harvard. Over the last few years, Microsoft has spent billions on research and new product development. Billions. You, you could probably fund the Polish cultural sector for the rest of the century on the money that Microsoft spends on R&D um, to give us the, what was their, uh, their um, MP3 player? <laughs> Nobody remembers. Um, uh, uh, there was a, uh, what do they have to show for it? Nothing, zero. The innovators that create wealth come instead from interlopers, startups, smaller enterprises more capable of seeing and seizing opportunities thrown up by change. Another piece of advice from John Cotter, arguing for small, for small pieces is, with time and thought, Anyone can generate dozens of ideas that are relevant to a specific situation. I was thinking about this in our workshops this morning. Um, my advice, don't try. A long list can be overwhelming. A sense of being overwhelmed stops action instead of encouraging it. A better strategy is to identify three or four ideas that can be easy to implement, implement and start doing so immediately. I see this language too a lot, and I'll read just at the end of this quote. Um, yeah, moving quickly, they often, at the end of the quote, when most people have stopped reading, they say something like this, and I think this is really cool. Um, they say that uh, uh, the, the, the working this way makes it easy to measure and track customer behavior constantly and to invite suggestions and criticism. So when you start doing, when you start putting a product in front of your professor, in front of your colleagues, your teachers, you can attract input that helps shape the rest of what you're doing, the real thing you're supposed to be doing. Most people, you never get it right the first time. You always get it right through iteration. Um, and uh, another benefit of small, starting small, thinking big, starting small, is this uh, the, the sort of the attractive quality of accomplishing something in a team. This is again from John Cotter. He says, real transformation takes time, and a renewal effort risks losing momentum if there are no short-term goals to meet and celebrate. Without short-term wins, too many people give up or actively join the ranks of people who have been resisting change. If you work for a big institution, you've seen this a million times. Co uh, commitments to produce short-term wins help keep the urgency level up and force detailed analytical thinking that can clarify or revise visions. There's that piece again, that last part of the thought about clarifying and revising what you're thinking. It's this learning process that's the thing you want to architect in your organizations. Um, but I want to warn too, and this took me a while to figure out, I want to warn too against what I would call incrementalism. The idea that if you've got a problem if your organization is stuck or backwards, that you can tweak, you can make small modifications to it to get out of that problem. I see a lot of institutions very happy 
tweaking a little bit at the margins of their problem without really addressing the big problem in the middle. And it gives the feeling of satisfaction of accomplishing something without actually building the thing you want to do. And thought leader Kathy Sierra, who's a completely awesome thinker about social media and participation, her new book is called um, Badass Making Your Users Awesome. Um, <laughs> it's a very challenging and cool book. Um, I could give a whole talk about Kathy, but she says, this is, she says, the big frickin' wall. Now, this is the big problem you're trying to get past. And she says, where you are now is here, and this is where you can get with incremental improvements, with tweaks, but you need to be here. So I'll, a, a really specific example, um, when uh, social media, when Facebook started to become popular and Twitter, a lot of museums knew they were supposed to be online and that being online would help change and help serve the public. And so they started tweeting or they put up a Facebook page and they kind of checked that checkbox. Like, we're changing now because we're tweeting without really addressing the deeper, uh, the deeper, more challenging aspects of change that openness brings. So this is incremental versus substantial change. Um, okay, finally, final part of the equation, moving fast. What does that really mean? Um, I love to remember, and actually it's, it's not widely known that the name for Wikipedia, wiki wiki, comes from the Hawaiian term for fast, super fast. Wiki is fast and wiki wiki is super fast. And um, the inventor of the wiki and the, one of the co-founders of Wikipedia, uh, found this term from the airport shuttle at the Honolulu airport. Um, this is from the Wikipedia article about the founding of Wikipedia and, and wikis. And so it's the wiki wiki shuttle. The reason wikis work, the reason Wikipedia works so much is because it's fast, it's easy, it's fast. Um, tons and tons of quotes um, uh, and despair from people in cultural institutions trying to make change happen quickly. I love this quote from Eric Schmidt from Google. Uh, he observes, the problem is most companies today are, are, are run, designed, to minimize risk, not maximize freedom and speed. I know most, the whole point of having a memory institution a lot of times is to not change, right? To not just go whatever way the wind blows. We're architected to be resistant to change for good reasons a lot of times. Um, so it makes sense. A lot of business is the same too. Um, Eric goes on to observe that slow doesn't work in this environment. Um, I thought an interesting point of reference was, so one of the things when you come up with a concept like this, like, okay, what does speed mean for real businesses? Does speed work for a hospital? Um, does speed work for a nuclear power plant? Um, for something that takes a lot of uh, coordination and human effort? There's a strong argument by a, a former astronaut that even NASA needs to pick up the speed says that if you just launch one or two rockets a year, one space shuttle a year, back when the space shuttle was flying, you can't learn and improve your systems fast enough to get better. Contrast this with the Soyuz rocket flown in Russia, which where they have hundreds of launches a year. They get much better. That's why that platform is so stable, is because they practice. So astronaut Edward Liu was arguing that even NASA needs to get better by iterating faster. Okay. But I want to make an observation about slowness. Um, it is absolutely true that some things do take time. Um, at the Smithsonian, we had a researcher who, I might not get the story exactly right, but he went to the desert of the um, Northwest United States every year for 12 or 14 years, uh, studying leaf fossils, 230, 250 million year old leaf fossils didn't produce a lot from it. Um, but then one day he created from his study of those fossils an algorithm with which he could correlate the outline of the fossil leaf with the amount of carbon that was in the atmosphere when the leaf grew. So he found a way over a decade or more to uh, look back 200 million years at the climate, which is an incredibly important tool for understanding climate change today. Like, he didn't do that by uh, you know, quick fixes, by quick burning engine. Uh, it took time. There's, 
absolutely a role for that kind of thought and scholarship in society. But I found that behind many slow projects are a lot can be a lot of small, fast things. And this, this idea of abundance, of having your results be so clear that, that you don't need a PhD to understand them. Maybe this is a good example. This is from Christo's Running Fence. Um, Christo and his wife, I mean, not Running Fence, uh, the Rap de Pont Neuf in Paris. Um, I love their works. They're yeah, they're, they're wonderful works. So, um, uh, you know, how would you, this is a 1995 project, um, but how would you measure the success of this as a cultural investment? Right? How, would, how on earth would you measure that? Um, in the documentary about the rapt upon the, there's this moment when a huge crowds have gathered, and these two strangers, I, I tried to capture it in a, without violating too many copyrights. Um, uh, these two guys, this guy and this guy, are having this argument about the nature of art in front of this huge crowd. And if you see the body language, everyone's just sort of riveted. People are up on their toes, they're leaning forward. They're just having this incredible argument. The one guy says, um, it's pure art. This is pure art. It's free to express what you feel. And the other guy says, it's not art. If you tell me this is art, then we're not saying the same language. And they have this long discussion. And it's, um, uh, yeah, explain to me what art is. Explain to us what it is. Tell us what it is. It's complicated. And they end up saying that the this installation, whatever it is, it will endure in their memory, and it's caused these two strangers to have this conversation together that ordinarily wouldn't have met. And, and when you watch this video, um, you know, we talk about engagement and user experience and participation in our projects, and we struggle to derive meaning from those interactions in the terms of more downloads, or more shares, or more likes, or more visitors through the door. Um, but when you look at the crowds in Paris at the Pont Neuf, and you see the body language, uh, and you listen to the debates taking place between strangers, you don't need a microscope or a PhD to understand that there's something deeply significant here, a very high level of engagement. So um, I think strategy is a useful tool. Sometimes the absence of strategy can absolutely be an impediment. Um, and agile processes, think big, start small, move fast. It's not a worldview. It's not a philosophy. It's a tool. Um, but all that being said, given the level of evidence that I've seen, my advice is choose to work on things that matter to your society and your organization. Look for abundance of success. Use a healthy mix of planning and doing, not too much of either one. Be open in all senses of the word, open to new ideas. Um, pick a general direction for your institution. Work with your network and, as Jack Welch said, implement like hell. And you'll be much happier than spending the next three years working on strategies. That's what I got. Thank you very much. Thank you.